So uh, my name's Chris. I'm going to introduce myself in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, but I just wanted to give some context to the, uh, to the presentation today um, and the title, because um, I know the title, the description, and what we're talking about today might all be a little bit uh, askew. So uh, we're talking about communities here as value drivers for business. Um, and, the, and the talk is going to be a bit, a bit kind of consultancy, a bit high level, um, the stuff you might agree with, the stuff you might not agree with, but there's certainly a, a, something that is working for us here in EPAM, and we wanted to share that with you. That's why this is a whole kind of deep dive, hands-on approach. Uh, everything we talk about today is derived from the kind of individual level as well. So everything that we, we're talking about is concerned with, with a single individual and then how that builds up into the organization. Uh, and for the purpose of this presentation, we're, we're treating OSPOs as kind of entities in their own right. Um, and the, this idea that uh, a single contributor drives a community and that community drives a business value. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, well, introductions. Then we're going to talk about this whole idea of OSPOs and the enterprise, uh, as grand as that sounds. Uh, then we're going to talk about a little bit of the kind of insights, the behind the scenes stuff around how we measure this value at EPAM. Um, and then a little bit around return on investment and OSPOs. Uh, and then some thanks and Q&A. But before we do that, um, I thought we'd introduce ourselves. So I'll kick off. Um, I'm Chris Howard, the lead open source program manager over at EPAM. Um, and I'll tell you about EPAM on the next slide. Um, you can find me on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. Very proud of my LinkedIn username, actually. Um, but I'm also really interested in these areas at the bottom, sustainability, DNI, Spain, and French Bulldogs. I have a little Frenchie called Lily. So if any of those are relevant to you, please do come and have a chat with me afterwards. In particular, sustainability is a theme you'll kind of see through this presentation, and I'm sure you're all aware, sustainability and security being kind of the two hot topics around open source at the moment. Uh, and this is my amazing colleague, Anastasia. Uh, hi, I'm Anastasia. I'm product owner at EPAM Open Source Program Office, where I'm responsible for the development of different tools we use for internal purposes to measure our community. And you may probably hear about our open source index that measures the uh, involvement of uh, commercial organizations in open source, uh, the value it brings, and so on. Uh, yeah, I'm also interested in life sciences and have uh, experience working in the clinical trial in particular and uh, for development uh, of these tools. And uh, yeah, I'm passionate about uh, German language, culture, and especially expressionists. Yeah. Excellent. Great. So uh, this is probably the, the only pitchy kind of salesy slide, but we, we know quite a lot of you. We're kind of a really big company that lots of people haven't heard of, so we wanted to give some context to who EPAM are. We're about 60,000 headcount across the globe, uh, and this slide gives an overview of our, uh, of our OSPO and the kind of activities we're up to. Um, some great shout-outs here to To Do Group, for example, Linux Foundation, some of the organizations we're associated with. Um, the index that uh, Anastasia mentioned as well around uh, the Open Source Contributor Index, we're 19th on that, which shows kind of global contribution of organizations uh, into open source. And I encourage you all to have a look at that, opensourceindex.io. Um, but we, we really are a kind of community led uh, engineering focused OSPO. So uh, I know there's a paper that's just come out from the to-do group around structures of, of OSPOs and we sit within our CTO's function. So we're, we're pretty high up in, in, in a very sizable organization, uh, but that gives us some real benefits in terms of kind of getting buy-in leverage and, and really making some kind of swift kind of overarching decisions in a, in a very big company. Um, like you see, lots of statistics there around kind of projects that we maintain, languages, etc. And that's really a, a kind of theme of today's presentation is we're going to be showing you the tooling and the metrics that we, that we use to gather this and, and why we feel that's important and how that helps us with this whole journey uh, at EPAM. What's really exciting as well is this, uh, I mentioned this in a talk I did last time, around this $50,000 that we award to our open source contributors. So we, we personally pay bonuses to people who contribute to open source within EPAM, whether or not that's a client project or their own. Um, and that caused a few mumbles last time when I was talking at the Finos conference around you pay people to, to contribute to open source, does that not just encourage them to go home and work on open source in their own time, et cetera? If it does, then, then go for it. But for us, we're really, really proud of it, um, that we're, we're recognizing and encouraging our engineers to, to kind of do what they enjoy and passionate. And, and for us, it looks good. It helps our external reputation. Um, but for them, we, we're saying kind of, yeah, please, please do carry on. And here's some encouraging uh, donation, if you like, or bonus to, to, to drive that forward. So I suppose in the enterprise, uh, what are we talking about here? Well, we're going to expand the idea of kind of OSPOs as an entity. Uh, and it's this whole idea of when two worlds collide. So I said there's going to be some kind of blue sky controversial, perhaps, statements here. But this idea, really, that 
OSPOs, and I'm sure you'll all agree, are kind of collaborative, honest speaking, transparent, round, open, community orientated organisations. And sometimes commercial organisations, commercial enterprises, not all, very important, um, are a bit hierarchical, have barriers to innovation sometimes, a bit closed, and are very data driven. And that's not a problem. The next slide we're going to talk about the, the importance of that data. But sometimes this clash um, can, can be a bad thing. Uh, but, but in our view, I don't think it is a bad thing. And the whole purpose of this talk today is around how we can start to meld these two worlds together. So OSPOs as a, as a function and the enterprise and, and how we can start to have a, a much stronger overlap in terms of delivering business value. So how do open source communities kind of represent uh, or the open source communities that OSPOs represent fit into this larger uh, enterprise uh, analogy? Um, and that's this zone that we're talking about, a, a very exciting diagram. So in order to answer this question, um, we need to recognize really that enterprises are increasingly becoming uh, obsessed, rightly so, about data, metrics, business intelligence, et cetera. And, and the amount of talks we've heard this week around metrics and community measurement, et cetera, is a testament to that, really. Uh, and I think, and certainly we're seeing now, is that OSPOs are increasingly being tasked to, to demonstrate the value that they're delivering, or certainly the value that open source is delivering for the organization. But conveying that value is, is, is actually a really difficult conversation sometimes. Uh, the Linux Foundation, and I'm going to have to look at my slide here, the Linux Foundation State of Open in FS report stated that management continues to be the hardest problem because they're teaching them, we're teaching them something that's completely new. It creates a disconnect that can cause them to bristle at the idea of upstream contribution, releasing open source work, or participating in working groups, or simply just presenting at an event. So this idea that I suppose we're all excited and passionate about what we're trying to achieve and the value that we're trying to deliver, but in reality, uh, the, the leaders and the, the people at the top of the organization aren't, aren't still quite not getting it. So how can we do that? Well, I believe, and certainly what we're doing at EPAM, and that's why we're here today, is that we need to start speaking the kind of language of data. So this, this idea that uh, OSPOs can kind of learn and adopt a, a new language as to how we communicate business value it is the focus of why we're here. And Forbes stated that metrics at their very, very best give leaders uh, new insights when they're constantly being re-evaluated, re but at the very, very worst, at least just given uh, an indication of the direction of the wind uh, in an always changing environment. So there is some real value in them. Um, and we heard a, talk, uh, a statement the other day, which was that metrics, what was it, fa fact and metrics are... Yeah, the data, uh, data is not the fact. Actually. Data are not facts, and we totally agree with that, but we also agree that data beats opinions. So we're not saying that data is the be-all and end-all, but we're also saying that, it, that it's not the, the kind of the worst thing ever, and that, that's why we're really excited about it, and Anastasia is going to talk about this in more detail. Uh, and I won't dwell on this diagram too much, but this whole idea, we're going we're gonna to keep referencing this kind of cyclical approach. Um, it doesn't show up very well, but there, is, there are some arrows flowing around here. Um, this idea of collecting and preparing data, so understanding the data we need to look at, then analyzing it, making it digestible. This is the key, key part of what we're talking about today. Making this data digestible to business leaders, not to all of us in the room who understand what open source is, who understand what OSPOs are, who understand the terms that we're using. Making this very, very easily digestible and understandable. And then applying that to do two things. One, in a business context, optimize operations. So increase revenue, reduce cost. That's all we're talking about here. Secondly, optimize decisions, so strategy. How do we change strategy and direction? How do we influence that as a result of this data collection? And once we've done that, that then informs the next set of data we need and so on, and we start this process again. So how do we answer that question then around demonstrating value? Well, I've got my mouse all over the place. Firstly, we need to identify the benefits or the value of open source. And I know so many of you are going to go, oh my gosh, another talk about the benefits of open source. That's not what we're here for today. There's some obvious omissions on this slide. This slide is not about the benefits of open source. This is instead about the value that open source provides to business leaders. So what's going to make your CIOs, your CTOs ears kind of stand up and listen when you talk about open source? And, and these are kind of six areas that we, within EPAM, kind of are having those conversations. And we've looked, at, we've looked and identified the value of open source from a kind of business leader's position in that, in that, state, in that sense. Um, how do we change this conversation, therefore, to then be kind of a data-driven enterprise talk um, so that OSPOs are therefore being pulled into this? Well, that's what we're going to do our deep dive on shortly. And how do we quantify this value um, so that OSPOs, and this is the really exciting part, I was getting very excited about this over a, a Guinness last night, is that OSPOs can ultimately, and I genuinely believe we can, start to contribute towards achieving organizational OKRs, KPIs, strategic goals. 
And I think that's the next step, really, for us in terms of dem demonstrating and delivering value. So before Anastasia takes over, what might this look like in practice? Because this is, this is great to see these kind of values of, of, of open source. Well, I genuinely believe that OSPOs can ultimately start to contribute towards things like reducing attrition by 25%. So a, a goal of, uh, of an organization is to re uh, reduce attrition by 25%. Open source 100% can start to contribute into this, and we're going to demonstrate how. Secondly, build new competencies around latest languages. So Rust, for example, a Rust center of excellence. Or I mentioned the sustainability was going to come a theme, the one that I'm really, really passionate about, reach net zero by 2025. So some of you are going to be thinking, Chris, you're on another planet here. The idea that someone writing a line of code here or using a, a line of open source code can help achieve, I don't know, Accenture's net zero 2025 target, et cetera. Yes, I genuinely believe they can. I believe that OSPOs can be a critical part, as per any other business function, in part of that conversation. And when we see this in a diagram like this, which again, apologies, it's not showing up very well. I should have should have looked at this a bit better. Um, but this idea that vision and mission of an organization, you, you all get this, I'm sure, flowing down to kind of key results. What I think we need to start seeing is these traditional business functions, marketing, finance, security, et cetera. We now need to start really putting OSPOs at kind of front and center of that. I think we, as, as kind of OSPO leaders and individuals, should be proactive and saying we want to be part of that conversation. Why are we not being brought into that? We can deliver value. We can help with that conversation. But similarly, I think our business leaders should start to wake up and go, actually, you should be part of that conversation. And yes, of course, it's nice for us to just keep operating in our little houses and spending the money and doing all of our community advocacy stuff. That's fantastic. But at the same time, why do we not want to be part of that journey around saying, well, actually, we were, we were a real critical part, of, a, a real critical gear in that kind of machine around achieving uh, X, Y, Z, OKR. So what does that mean in terms of community engagement? Well, at EPAM, this is, this is exactly how we operate. This is what we see. Uh, so many times, myself, Thomas, who's the head of our uh, um, OSPO, who many of you will be familiar with, we get our CIO, our CTO, pinging us a message and saying, why, why are we not delivering on this? Or what are we delivering on this? And we're going to show you some, some insights into this. It's going to be a transparent talk. Uh, but Anastasia is now going to go for a little bit more around how data really is at the kind of heart of all of our operations here at EPAM. Uh, yeah, thank you. Just as Chris said, uh, we put data at the heart of our open source program office and to make data-driven decisions to convince business that uh, we do deliver a value, our open source community uh, has a value and um, we need to answer the following question is actually who is our community, yes, who are these people, what do they do, what drives them and uh, how does it change the industry, what's the impact? Uh, looking for answers to these questions uh, I just raised, um, we encountered like several categories or groups of metrics that can really help us to identify the value for us, uh, to qualify what we do and also to show this value to our business. Uh, if we look uh, in particular at community metrics, we can uh, tell our story about the numbers of active contributors in the company, whether this number grows or not. Um, whether they are active or not, who, who uh, joins our community, who, who leaves it, why. We also can talk about geography of our contributors, wh where they are located, uh, about diversity and so on and so forth. Uh, but we can also look uh, at individuals and we actually do it. What, what drives them? Yes, what, what, what do they do? What language uh, they use? And uh, we can combine it with uh, our community data and getting insights, for example, in geography of adopted languages at EPAM. EPAM has a lot of offices around the globe, and we see that, for example, now it's a trend uh, in the Western, Euro uh, Western Europe to adopt Java language, while in Eastern Europe it's Python on the top. Um, and we can go to the next group, industry group. It's all about the project our, our uh, in-place contributors uh, contribute to. Yeah, we see uh, what do they do and also can combine it somehow in getting insights into, for example, uh, we uh, recruited uh, 20 people who uh, contribute to Go language, I don't know, last month. Uh, how, how did it change the whole a landscape of open source office uh, within EPAM. W what's the difference? Do, do they really um, bring, uh, bring value or to the open source uh, office or not? Um. Chris? Great. Yeah, so 
So you've seen how we're really putting kind of data at the center of our operations. And, and we've heard a lot of talks uh, this week around various platforms and metrics and open source solutions. We want to be transparent here. We built our own solution. We're an engineering company. This is our own internal tool. It's got a really awful name, which we're not going to repeat. Um, but we're looking, <laughs> we are ultimately going to productize this and, and probably push it out to the market. That, and that's us putting our hands in the air and saying this is probably something we're excited about and we'll do. So the next few slides, we're actually going to show you three scenarios of, of how we're using this system internally to really tell the, these stories. Um, and we want you to think back to that diagram of the three kind of flows around collecting and preparing. So why do we need the data? Analyzing it, how are we presenting that data to business leaders? Really important. Everything's got to be super clear and digestible. No kind of OSPO specific terms. And then thirdly, how can we then apply what we're learning from that data to then help us shape both our um, operations, so increase revenue, reduce costs, or strategy, so achieving our OKRs. So first things first, this is going to be a little bit of a, a two-person show now. So Anastasia is going to tell us about what we're seeing on the data, and then I'm going to talk about the exciting kind of business value. Uh, yeah, this is the real example of the project maintained by EPAM. So on the first graph, we can see the velocity, uh, so how many contributions our team does per month. We can predict here the um, Next uh, months, we can see also the average, uh, can see the gaps in the data. And for example, if we want to uh, look uh, specifically in a specific month uh, to see what, what's the difference there, what, why, we, why do we see a drop, for example, in August comparing to July, we can go deeper to the project activity um, uh, graph showing us the actually the pulse of the project, right? So. Uh, for example, from the 20th of August, we see the decrease in the number of contributions. And uh, here we, uh, where we actually can start our gap analysis to identify the reasons behind our root cause analysis, really. What we're trying to say here is if we swap push events for story points, and we think about all of these enterprise project management tools that we've all got in our organizations. So we've got Jira, we've got I know, Microsoft Projects, we've got all of these beautiful s systems we're using. And we're asking our project managers, our delivery managers, every day to provide status updates, rag updates, etc. But we're just not doing that for open source. So how are we reporting on our open source activity? How are we reporting that similar question we're asking all of our business leaders, how to, to qualify what they're delivering, the value? Why were we not doing that for open source? So this, this is one view as exactly how we're delivering that quality. We're, we're giving our project maintainers, our product owners, et cetera, who are in the open source space, exactly the same tools, because we want to be part of that conversation. We want to be delivering against OKRs, so that when that I don't know, quarterly business review comes along and we say to people, OK, give me your project statuses, the open source team aren't there in the corner going, oh, well, I, I don't really have the mechanism to present that to you. Well, now you do, and we're expecting exactly the same thing from you. But similarly, we're also going to come down hard if we're not seeing kind of the right level of velocity or we're not seeing the right kind of uh, governance in place, et cetera. And what this also does is it provides early indications around issues such as dropping cadence. Now, yes, there's some conflicting ideas around there around community-led kind of initiatives, et cetera, but we're operating some of our open source projects as real kind of enterprise-level programs, and we, and we want to be seeing kind of a real sustained development. So if we're starting to see drops in velocity, or we're starting to see, really interestingly, that no one contributes on Wednesdays, for example, very, very peculiar, then why? What are we identifying? What's the reasons behind this? So this is the kind of tool that's in that enabling our maintainers, our product owners, to be able to pick up this kind of conversation that our delivery managers are having, and we'd love to, in the future, start to integrate this into our other project management platforms so it all comes into one. But at the moment, this is the kind of visual. So to go back to the idea of delivering business value, this is enabling us to, to kind of deliver quality products and solutions on time and on budget, which is after all, for an enterprise, one of the most important things. Second example. Uh, yes, contribution data also uh, provides visibility of new languages being used uh, within the organization or, in our case, by open source enthusiasts uh, at EPAM. Uh, and on the pie chart, we see the, here that this uh, small piece uh, of data showing that, for example, 0.1% of contribu contributions made were uh, made to a specific language. So we can identify this. This is like a lighthouse for us, right? But then we can go... Uh, <clears throat> uh, deeper, yeah, and see what's, uh, what repos people contribute to. And actually, who are these people? Who are these individuals? We can even compare uh, their activity uh, to each other. This way, we can identify uh, early adopters of the language. In this case, we used, for example, uh, Rabi, but this can be really any language. Uh, once we identify these adopters, we compare them somehow, we can actually 
uh, th these people can fit in particular area for every project, not not uh, necessary open source one, or they can even uh, start uh, building community within the organization, which is which they actually do. This is one I get really excited about. I, I, obviously, you can tell I get excited about a lot of things, but um, this one is really exciting because how many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with the idea of your pre-sales teams or your account managers coming to you and saying, we've got a client inquiry, they want to know what competency we've got around X language or X technology. This is live, so we can log onto our system right now and we can see that these two people are contributing to this brand new dependency library language that's just come out. We can immediately go to them and say, look, we've just had a, a query come in from a client. We can react immediately to industry and we can say, look, we've got some response we've got these people working on this project, etc. Otherwise, what's the alternative? Well, we're relying upon people to update their internal skills profile or we'll look at their LinkedIn, etc. In a 60,000 headcount organization, can we, really have, can we really count on that reaction around people saying, oh, I've just contributed to this new language, etc. Oh, I must go and update my internal profile, etc. Yes, they probably will, but it's not that kind of immediate, kind of responsive quick time. And if we think back to that slide at the beginning, one of the key values for kind of business leaders is around responsiveness, that ability to flex to what the industry is looking, that ability to demonstrate the latest capabilities and kind of technology adoption. So for us, this is really, really important. This idea that we can go right down, as I said on slide one, to the individual, to, to Michael and Paul here and say, look, we've got this RFP that's come in, this request for a, a quote or a context around this specific language. We can see you're working in this space. Can you jump on a call and tell us everything you know? And then the exciting thing, as Anastasia says, is that people then get really excited about it, that we're recognizing them. Then they say, well, how can you help us build a community? And it's that whole cyclical thing. It's that idea of like bringing people in, we're showing we're excited and engaged with what you're doing, they're excited that we're engaged, and then we help them to nurture this. And then thinking about that OKR about building a, a Rust center of excellence, well, we've started the ball rolling now. So we are, we are moving that kind of thing forward, we're getting excited about it, we're showing our employees that we count and, and we value them. Uh, and this is something that I'm, I'm in this system, gosh, every day, the amount of requests that come in, I'm always checking who, who, who is and isn't. And really important to say, these repos, I don't know they're real, are they? Oh, they are real, so do check them out. Yeah, but Michael and Paul are not real, unfortunately. And then our th uh, third scenario, our third and final scenario. Uh, yeah, this is about the people who actually joined our community from the beginning of this year and who left it, so come gone. And in the, uh, like, uh, in the middle, you can see the net change uh, that allows us to uh, like see, see the exact picture, visualize it, and uh, see how many actually people joined us and left the company. Uh, we see, for example, the uh, drop in starting from February uh, and continuing in March, uh, and uh, it reflects actually the, the whole uh, situation happens uh, with our offices closures uh, in um, uh, Eastern Europe, so uh, w which also reflects on the data, but starting from June we see the uh, <coughs> increasing uh, number of contributors joining the team and this is the right time when we started our education program for the uh, developers uh, and starting prom started promoting our open source office uh, for newcomers uh, so this is actually w how we qualify our value and what we are doing it at EPAM. Yeah, so this is, um, these numbers are quite small in a, a 60,000 60, people company. So this is just specifically uh, hires of open source engaged individuals that we know via a GitHub ID. So it's still quite niche. We could expand it, but we thought that might be a bit too, uh, bit too transparent for, for something that's been recorded. So um, absolutely, what's exciting here is, is just to dwell on what Anastasia is saying, is that this, this ever so slight peak here is what we're saying is that we can, we know that, uh, this isn't fact, we know there's other influences, but what we're saying here is that this is a measure of our value in able to say that things like our education program, things like our rewards and recognition initiatives, etc., are retaining open source engaged engineers. And that's the most important. I was speaking at Finos a few months ago around talent acquisition and retention, and one of the most important is around providing training and job security enrichment opportunities. And what we're demonstrating here, what we're seeing is despite all of those challenges around the invasion and the loss of employees, etc., we are, we're confident that the initiatives that we're putting in place and the things that we're doing to retain employees, particularly open source engaged, as of course enterprise adoption of open source is growing, we also want to be an organization that's retaining those people. We don't want to be losing our talent to other organizations who are therefore a few steps ahead of us. So this metric is a really exciting one for me. And I know that you know I'm uh, logged, logged, logged in every month to look at this one and share this with the leadership because this is exactly the leadership language we're talking about. This doesn't necessarily get as excited in the room as OSPOs, maybe it does, 
does for me, but it absolutely makes sense to our people functions. It absolutely makes sense to our HR teams. So when I'm going back to our leaders and saying, we need some more money to get some more marketing out to, to the uh, GitHub communities around EPAM and why you want to come and work here, this is the story I'm telling. We want open source engaged engineers to put us at the front foot forward in terms of open source enterprise and helping our clients. And this is the metric that's telling us and supporting us on that journey. So what does this all mean? Uh, ROI, uh, very exciting. You can probably tell I, I used to be a consultant. Um, so everything we touched on is really about delivering value and presenting it. And there's two examples here, very stretched out, um, but yeah, we, we're still not quite sure how we build a framework around this. But if you like, this whole conversation we're talking about today is around demonstrating kind of ROI on open source. So something that we have recently been under pressure to demonstrate, or we had a growing team and we've really expanded our footprint within EPAM. But the best way I think to explain this, and I've written it down to, to get it accurate, is that this whole conversation is about seeing visible results from the operational strategic decisions made as a result of open source community measurement. So everything we spoke about, the idea of a single individual, a single contributor, measuring that, applying it to business-centric thinking that can influence strategic decisions and achieve OKRs, then enables us to deliver business value. So this whole conversation, yes, it's one single contributor, one single individual writing one line of code or documentation or translating an issue, etc., ultimately can help achieve some of those real high-level OKRs that I think I suppose we should be waving the flag at. And we've got two walkthrough examples. So the first one is around this whole idea of recruiting talent. Still very high level. I appreciate there's lots of other influences. But one is around let's hire in the very best open source engaged talent. So however we do that, let's do it. Once we do that, let's listen to them. So we've brought them in. What's the problem? What, what are we doing wrong? How can we change our policy? How can we enhance our process? Open source engaged engineers know what they want, so let's do it and change it. Once we've done that, then we can build better products. We can start to deliver better quality. We can start to enable more faster progress. And once we've done that, we can celebrate it, and then we can repeat it. So we go back to that kind of three-tiered three and repeat. Bring in more talent, grow, et cetera, et cetera. The next one, a bit more abstract, but I love this one, and I, we're definitely going to do it. And we, we're really excited about the Green Software Foundation, if any of you uh, are familiar with that organization. Let's build a culture of open source consumption and contribution, so leveraging people like the to-do group. Um, once we've done that, let's educate people internally on, on open source, so strive for the idea of reusing of code over bespoke, which is very difficult for an organization like EPAM. That's where we make our money, building kind of bespoke solutions for our clients. But let's educate people on the, the benefits, the ESG, the environmental social benefits of open source. Once we do that, let's try and reduce our impact. So let's, let's try and measure one line of code and its carbon footprint, for example. And, and let's say that oh, we used X lines of open source code last year, so this equates to, I don't know, X carbon, whatever it happens to be. And Green Software Foundation are trying to build a model around that. And then once we've done that, let's celebrate that and influence our strategy, change our operations, and repeat the process. And all of this is about building business value. So a lot of us are sitting here thinking, yeah, but Chris, this is, this is kind of a few steps away from what we're doing on a day-to-day, -day, or, or this is a bit outside of my remit. It might be at the moment, but this whole conversation is about actually making it part of our remit. So we're saying we want to be part of this conversation. We want to be delivering this value. We want to be in that, kind of that board meeting when we're talking about these OKRs. So please bring us to the table, and this is how we're going to start to, to demonstrate and deliver that value. So. That brings us to the end, uh, 30 minutes. Before we jump into questions, I want to say thank you all for listening. But I also just want to embarrass Anastasia and say this is her first conference that she's ever spoke at. So congratulations, uh, Anastasia, for thank getting you. through this. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. Um, so we, I'm not going to say we practice inner source. Um, and I think Claire, for example, from inner source comments will probably agree with me. Um, I don't think we can say that we do practice inner source. We do practice code collaboration and sharing of code and centralized repositories, et cetera. But I wouldn't say that we're mature, um, and I'm going out on a whim here, mature enough to say that we've practiced that. But of course, in a massive engineering company, there, are, there is 
benefits of sharing code and reuse and all of this. So we definitely have ways of working that would align with some of those kind of inner source principles. And we certainly, through things like our NGEX um, consultancy offering that we provide to our clients around great engineering practice, DevOps, et cetera, educate our clients on what that looks like. But we haven't yet wrapped that up as a kind of inner source label. Um, I think we're close to it, but, but we're not calling it inner source, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but this is not this is not a this is not a business development opportunity. So yeah, <laughs> chat chat to me afterwards about that one. Thank you. Sure, go ahead. UK and Serbia, but we, we, we knew this question was going to come up. We, we, yeah. Do you have there? Or how 100%. And, and you might not like the answer. So two years ago, we had the exact thing because our system allows every single colleague in EPAM to log on to that system and look at open source contribution. So you can drill down. You can say, Chris Howard contributed 300 push events to these repositories on these specific times, a bit like your GitHub dashboard, but of course, it's identified exactly who it is, and I can look at your profile. And our German colleagues were going crazy, <laughs> like crazy. So we, we went back to the lawyers, we went back to our HR team, we checked our contract, and by working at EPAM, you've signed a contract to say that basically we have access to that data, so, so we do. Our struggle now is if we turn this into an enterprise product and we start offering this to the market, the key thing for us, and, and I, I'm going I'm to reference this because we haven't heard this at all this week actually, is that Unlike some of the other metrics tools that we've demonstrated this week, and, we're, and we love those, and we, we, Batergia, for example, doing fantastic stuff, Chaos doing amazing stuff, our key differentiator is that we integrate with a HR platform. So we're going to look to integrate with things like SAP, Workday, our own HR platform, and the onus then is on the employer to gather all of those uh, IDs for GitHub, for Bitbucket, for et cetera. So the onus is on the employer. We're just providing the visualization, the business value, the, the messaging around that. So what how we feel we're escaping that is we're not we're not scraping from all of these websites and then aggregating it and saying oh here's here's Chris's profile Chris has actually shared his data with his employer all of his IDs and then we're mapping them across and saying oh well now we can do a one to one pairing you're going to answer the next question <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll get this one. Um, so the question was around, are we doing kind of an end-to-end -end, um, mapping of, of talent acquisition? So from the very first contact all the way through to now they've joined the company, why did they join, et cetera, et cetera. We do provide our talent acquisition team with like a one-pager on why open source is important. But what we're really excited about, and we haven't yet explored it, is this idea that, I used it in the talk, this kind of hiring for influence. So like picking some really exciting maintainers in projects and bringing them into EPAM. But maybe six months before we start to do that, kind of get into their profile a little bit. So the HR team put a little tag on to say, oh, we reached out to Mateus and we, we spoke about this, et cetera. There's a little flag there. And then we see what that journey looks like. And then what happens is when they join the company, we can then, and th this is where this data point comes really contested, actually, is, is then we can say, did his contributions increase or did they decrease? Or him joining EPAM, did that then limit his open source engagement or did it really rocket it forwards, et cetera? So, of course, that data wasn't ours pre-employment, but it is in the public domain. So what, how, can we, how can we answer your question? How can we start to do that kind of whole long tail journey? And even when they leave the company, what happens? Let's say they go and join Red Hat, for example, and Red Hat's got all this fantastic kind of collateral and ways of working in open source. Do they then get even better at their open source contribution? OK, what can EPAM be doing to learn and leverage that and retain our employees? So I think we'd love to be able to build a model, but there really is some data concerns around that one, absolutely.
Uh, okay, yeah, I'll answer this question. So uh, for this presentation, we used push event just like a, you know activity unit that we can actually present. Uh, and since we talk with uh, business people, uh, the most sense for them mean is uh, actually make for them is uh, um, the lines of code, right? Push events as an entity because once you completed your let's say task, you, you pushed it. Uh, this is why we used push events. But as for the rest, like social engagement, some social network, network communication, documentation, and so on and so forth. Yes, it's also in uh, our, you know, uh, backlog for, for the implementation for EPAM especially, uh, but we just don't do it yet. Do you want to add something? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Of course, but you can uh, always uh, pick the uh, you know uh, activity unit that you are mostly interested in. We just uh, made the analysis and decided that this will make sense for EPAM because it does. Of course, some of the uh, contributors try to hack the system and you know just make one commit and, <laughs> and push it. Um, but we, uh, for example, for our recognition campaign, yes, uh, we we. Um, has a uh, find this uh, people who who do, who do this who who violate this system and just uh, not reward them <laughs> that's it yeah even our own employees are trying to get a bit more money out of us. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it does work. And, they, and they actually the open source index, the, the public version which measures commercial organizations, the same, the same model works. So I'm not telling you all if you're going to GitHub now and start doing kind of single commits commits after your ranking will climb. It will. But yeah, that it, it's based on we're not trying to cleanse the data. We're trying to show a real kind of honest account of what the activity looks like. OK, we've got, I think we've got like three minutes. So one more question, if there is one. Oh, go ahead. The real cost in terms of financial cost. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and um, um, and we don't, we, we're not, we're not able to say, okay, well, the Ospo costs a million pounds a year, for example, we're gonna, we're gonna break even. We, we can't, we can't do that. We, we don't have a mechanism to, to, to do that explicit one to one. So instead, that's why we found ourselves in this situation of having to do that kind of long tail business value around one line of code can provide X strategic value towards achieving this OKR. That was never at the, and hopefully it's brand new to some of you here, that was never at the forefront of our leaders' thinking. So it was always around financial ROI. It was around the bottom line. Of course, that's a commercial organization. But actually for us, what we're saying is a bit like some of your other non-revenue functions. So perhaps your people team, your legal compliance, et cetera. OSPOs can also be part of that in achieving these OKRs that, yes, in your annual report and your stakeholder reports, et cetera, contribute to that financial kind of prospect, but they don't have a direct dollar for dollar mapping around, you spent a million pounds here, we've given you a million pounds back. We, we don't believe we're going to be in a situation. And a final point on that, I think what we will be in a situation to do, because we've got one minute, is I think we will be able to very soon get to a point, and this is aspirational, of being able to say that one line of open source code equates to X in terms of different factors. So it could be that carbon model, it could be a carbon offset, it could be a few cents of, of, of revenue. It could be, I don't know, people hours or something. And it'd be great to come up with a model or a framework of what open source at EPAM means in terms of a line of code and how that applies to other kind of facets of our, of our operating model. Um, but that's kind of for the future. And once I get some more glossy slides to, to talk through that. But it's been great to speak to you all today. Thanks so much. And please do reach out to us on socials or come and find us uh, before we all fly back to our various destinations this afternoon. Thank you, everyone.